Yeah. And I think that's what we need to start doing is we need and we need to start to have a plan where the where we know what that infrastructure we're going to use is. So when this happens, you kick in quickly and all those things, you know, not because, you know, we would, I think that's hopefully the lesson that can come out of this. Okay, so we're at, we're at um, one uh, at uh, two o'clock, so I'm going to get started. So I, I know I assume that most of you have done your quizzes. I was checking the numbers, and it looked like the quizzes were coming in. But today I want to continue with our discussions of valuations. If you remember the last session, we were talking about emerging market company valuations, and one of the issues we talked about was the fact that with emerging market companies, you have the potential at least for more catastrophic risk. What is it? Truncation risk. I mean, let me explain what, what I mean by truncation risk. Usually when you value a company, you project out cash flows and you discount the cash flows at a risk adjusted discount rate. But what you're thinking about when you do that is the risk in your cash flows, that the cash flows in your six could be wrong. Truncation risk is you might not get to your six. And with emerging market companies, though not exclusively with them, because you can see with the COVID virus that this could happen in any market, you could have a crisis where your company's survival is put at risk by natural disaster. I still remember, you know, uh, you know with this, this five-star hotel in Egypt where it got attacked by terrorists and overnight the hotel basically was shut down forever. It could be, it could be acts of God, it could be terrorism risk, or it could be nationalization risk. What makes these risks unique is I call them discrete risks. If you remember early in our discussion of risk, we talked about continuous and discrete risk. Discrete risk, it's zero one. You either survive or you don't. And the problem with discrete risks is it's very difficult to adjust discount rates for discrete risk. In fact, everything we know about valuation was designed for continuous risk, which is terrible at dealing with discrete risk. So I'm going to use an example to illustrate how discrete risk plays out. So October of last year, as you well know, Aramco announced that it was going to go public. Okay? And you, you seldom get a chance like this, right? Overnight, you're going to get the most valuable market cap company in the world go from being a private company to a public company. For those of you not familiar with Aramco, it's actually a very simple company to value because it is just 330 million barrels of oil under the Saudi sands. So in October, when they filed their prospectus, I valued them. I valued them first using a dividend discount model. Why? Because Aramco is actually very explicit about how much dividends they're going to pay. It was like buying a bond. They guaranteed dividends of 75 billion in year one, and they said, we're going to keep dividends growing. So the first valuation I did was a dividend discount model, where I took the 75 billion, grew it at the inflation rate of 1%. So you can see it's 75, 75.75, 76.51 billion. And I kept it going for 50 years. Why 50 years? Hey, here's what I treated Aramco as. 330 million barrels of oil, 50 years of oil is what they have under the ground. I essentially extracted all the oil out. You don't have to use terminal values sometimes. You just have to do the projected cash flows. You know what they have at the end of 50 years as terminal value? Nothing. There's nothing left other than desert sands. So I have my expected dividends for the next 50 years. And I need to pick a discount rate. Now, when you're valuing a company like Aramco based on dividends, you almost guarantee these dividends. This is more like a bond than a stock. So if you look at my cost of equity, here's what I used. I started with a risk-free rate in US dollars, which was about 1.8% then. I used the betas for REITs and royalty trusts. REITs are, of course, real estate investment trusts, and royalty trusts are oil royalty trusts. And the reason I picked those is those are two sectors where the dividends are actually preset. The case of REITs, it's not a dollar value, it's a percentage of income, but it's a very, very high dividend paying investment. Notice the beta is very low. Why? Because you're essentially getting almost an equity that behaves like a bond. So with that low beta, the cost of equity I get looks really low, but I'm discounting just the dividends and there's no terminal value. The value that I got for Aramco with a dividend discount model and a really low cost of equity was about 1.63 billion. They say, how do you know they can afford to pay the dividends? That's easy to calculate, right? I computed their free cash rate equity. And in 2020, my estimate was their free cash rate equity would be 108 billion. Remember what they had promised as dividends was 75 billion. The reason they were able to make that promise is they had so much buffer built in. It'd be interesting to redo this valuation at a $22 or $25 oil price, but they clearly had buffer. So my second valuation of Aramco, I shifted from dividends to free cash flow equity. 
I let that free cash or equity grow at the growth rate, you know, the nominal GDP growth. But I also adjust my discount rate. Why? Because now you're running a more typical oil company because those free cash or equity are going to go up and down with oil prices. If you notice, I've shifted the beta to the beta for integrated oil, which is the big oil companies, the Exxon Mobiles, the Conocos, the Chevrons, and I get a higher cost of equity, but I also have higher cash flows. So I discount my free cash or equity at that higher cost of equity. The value that I get is very close to what I got before, about 1.65 billion. So the dividend discount model and the free cash or equity model, I'm getting about 1.6 to 1.65 trillion. I'm sorry, it's trillion dollars. I, you know, trillion is such a tough word to use. 1.65 trillion dollars. So let's say, I, you know, I almost thought about stopping there. But here's my question for you. When you invest in a Aramco, you're not just investing in an oil company, right? What are you investing in? The You're investing in what? A kingdom. A kingdom. You're basically investing in a country and a kingdom. You're investing in a country which is Saudi Arabia and the House of Saud. It's a joint bet, right? Are you worried about that bet? Could something bad happen to you that has nothing to do with the oil price? Remember the... Go, go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I, my trash truck is outside, so it's loud. It's a government and the House of Saud. What if you woke up to a new story that, that, that the House of Saud has been overthrown? Right? Your investment could very quickly go down the tubes, right? The risk you're worried about here is a truncation risk of regime change, right? So this value is kind of a value before that. So I tried to bring it in, and the way I tried to bring it in was not by trying to adjust the discount rate, because it's not that kind of risk. I basically broke down my valuation to two possible valuations. One is that the House of Saud continues to rule for the next 50 years and the value that I get is 1.65 trillion and I attach an 80% chance to it. But 50 years is a long time. So basically when I did my, when, when I did my calculation, I said there's a 20% chance of a regime change. That regime change can range the spectrum. It could be a, a regime change that completely nationalizes Aramco and end up with nothing, or it could be a regime change where I lose some but not all money. I assume that we're somewhere in the middle. So there's a 20% chance of regime change, and if that happens, the cash flows I get will be much lower, and the value that I get is about half the 1.65 trillion. My expected value is 1.485 trillion. One of the questions is, why can't I do it in a lambda? Lambdas don't work when you're talking about regime changes. Lambdas are designed to con capture continuous country risk. So when you have the kind of risk we're talking about here, you have to bring in explicitly. Julian asks, is there a chance of double counting? Don't worry, discount rates were never designed to capture this kind of risk. You know, sometimes you might see discount rates be higher, but the country risk we're building into discount rates is not for this kind of risk. It's really for the fact that my earnings and cash flows will be more uncertain if I invest in Brazil or Venezuela. It's not for the possibility that my company could be nationalized. So the 20% and the 0 0.82, you're saying, where do I get that? No, well, I made my best judgment. I'm not a pol political scientist, but I think there's a chance. Because ignoring it is also an assumption, right? Because then you're ignore, assuming that there will be no chance of regime change. So because there is a, there's that possibility, I brought it into the expected value. So I'm going to start, pause there and let people ask questions. So I, you know, unmute yourself because I have, I'm having a tough time tracking the chats. Now, Juliet asked a question about how I got to the 0.825 trillion. It was my assumption. I don't think that the new regime that comes in is going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs and completely nationalize. That's my assumption. So I think even if a different regime takes over Saudi Arabia, they might impose more constraints on how much Aramco can pay out in cash flows, but they're not going to make it zero. No. Go ahead, Sammy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so when it comes to a probability of I feel it's more like a rabbit hole. You can start reading. Yeah. Uh, Just make it a very shallow rabbit hole, right? Which is make your best judgment and move on. Is it zero? Let me ask you a question. Is it zero percent? No, it's not, nothing is zero percent. Nothing is zero percent. Is it close to zero percent? I wouldn't say so. 
So now we're talking. So if, if it was zero or close to zero, I would just go with my DCF value. And let, let, I'll be quite honest, if I'd been doing this in 2005, I might have been more inclined to go with zero or close to zero. You know what changed my mind? I went to Egypt, where Mubarak was supposedly dictator for life, get overthrown. I saw Libya, where Gaddafi was supposedly entrenched, get overthrown. What we've discovered in the last 12 years in the Middle East is things we thought could not be changed overnight, we saw changes. So my perspective, and maybe it's wrong, is altered by history here. So it's 20% right now, could it go down? Yeah, sure, maybe the, 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 the House of Saud can smooth this transition out so you don't have the kind of sudden upsurge of, my worry is $22 a barrel. Has the property gone up or down when oil prices are down to 22? What about today's, uh, let's say, fluctuations? Uh, yeah, that, that's what worries me, right? At the $20 oil price, I think you have a much greater chance of regime change. Why? Because how does this, how has the House of Saud been able to buy the peace, so to speak, for the last 50 years? What have they done? They sell the oil and then what do they use with the, do, the ca with, do with the cash? They provide a welfare system that is so all-encompassing. It's maybe not as big as Qatar, but basically, if you're a Saudi citizen, they've essentially ensured that you have enough of a safety net that you don't feel inclined to make things uncomfortable for yourself. Hey, when oil prices are $50, $60 a barrel, or Saudi Arabia has plenty of cash at $22 a barrel, they're in... This is as dangerous to Saudi Arabia as it is to Russia and the rest of the world, this fight between Saudi Arabia. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to me to have this fight. What do you gain from this? You actually make your risk much greater. So I think the 20% is, is, a, is a judgment call. It's an estimate. It could be wrong. But I would, I would start at 0 and 100 as my starting points and try to get to where do you think we fall closer to. And I came up with 20, but as I said, when you invest in Aramco, it's as much a political bet as it is a financial bet. Would the regime change affect something other than cash flows? Does it affect certain elements more than the others? And let me take an extreme case. What if the regime is ISIS? That's a kind of scary thought, right? I mean, it's uh, this could range from a completely destructive regime change where Aramco ceases to exist as an investment to regime change where you kind of get a smoother transition where the new regime that comes and says look Aramco is all we have in Saudi Arabia we cannot kill it we're going to keep it pretty close to what the House of Saud created so it's not just zero one it's what kind of regime comes into place right so you account for the fact that if a regime change happens tomorrow it has a far greater Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I think, so here I've attached one probability. In fact, when I posted this on my blog, you know, somebody said, why don't we have your specific numbers? And I said, I'd love to. But I had a tough enough time coming out. I think that if there's a regime change, if you're worried more about regime changes that loaded up front than happen later. So if the regime change happens in year 43 of your cash flows, you're obviously affected a lot less than if it happens in year one. Which is good news because it means that all you have to do is focus on near-term regime change. Right? Instead of thinking about it as a regime change, uh, like as a house of so, what if it became more of the way that the country is being run? So maybe still the that's that's basically what I mean by regime change. That's why I said it can range from a very innocuous change where almost nothing happens to a very abrupt change where everything changes overnight. And I think that the best case scenario for the House of Saud is that they create a smoother transition. And it's easier to make that smoother transition when oil prices are $60 a barrel than when they're $22 a barrel. So, going aside from, let's say, Saudi Arabia to other countries or other places, um, how effective is it to, to think about the political system and its effect on, on, on the cash flow? In the sense of saying, okay, 20%, there's a 20% chance that everything's going to get messed up, 40% chance that it stays the same, and then I start yeah. doing that kind of you can do that. You can do scenarios. You can do simulations. On the, I'll tell you what, where this becomes useful. You, you know, I'm not a political scientist, but remember that old debate about is a democracy or a dictatorship better for the economy? 
If you just looked at businesses, would a business prefer to be in a dictatorship where the rules are set and and basically the dictatorship can guarantee you that the rules will not change or would you rather as a business operate in a democracy where rules change all the time because governments keep changing? The answer seems obvious, right? You want to be in a place where the rules are fixed, you don't change anything, you know, they're, they're set over time. And what people miss is you're, you're, there's a trade-off here. With democracy, you get continuous change, right? Which is every four or five years, there's a new government that comes in, rewrites the rules, creates chaos. In a dictatorship, you have discontinuous change, the kind of discrete change. I think that's the way to think about how this plays out, is businesses and dictatorships look really good till the whole thing kind of comes apart at the seams because the, the, the risk you're facing is a discrete risk. But you can actually break it down into more scenarios if you feel, and the limited can be a continuous risk. And the closer it gets to continuous, the easier it is to manage. Adam, you have a question? 20% though. Is it just like the Pareto principle, or did you, is that based on historical assumption? Uh, the 20, uh, there is no history, right? How many countries have been overthrown? We don't have enough data to do this. I mean, I actually read through some politics sites, and I have to tell you, they were completely, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult to make it through these sites. You know, so there are people actually who make their living with, with insurance, where they estimate probabilities of change. So you can actually start to get data if you're interested, kind of digging through either insurance company sites or politics sites, because that's where you're going to find this. You're not going to find it on a finance site. Can we tap into CDS spreads for some You insurance? could, but CDS spreads again measure continuous risk more than that. That's why Saudi Arabia has a small CDS spread and a high rating, because it measures default risk, which is near term and, you know. So in the near term, people are not worried about Saudi Arabia. That's what the CDS says, but looking at a 50-year investment, you've got to be a little more concerned. There are no 50-year CDSs that I know of. Yeah, you can, and in fact, they can, you can assess maybe something from it. I've not found them to be particularly predictive of, they're very predictive of economic disruptions where economy is going to, so they were very predictive of Greece getting into trouble and then, you know, but they've not been predictive of political overthrows or government changes. No. Maybe because investors in that market are just as short term as investors in any other market. Well, for it to be automatically updated, it's got to be a number that gets updated in the market, right? So it's easier to build a system where that, that happens if there's a number I can watch that triggers the system. So if there's some number I could track, and I'll give you one suggestion. There are these political risk sites that measure the political risk in countries. I use PRS as one of the services I use. You can, a uh, high number there means you're more risky. So you could set your valuation where if that number goes above 50, which is a high number, then your discrete risk gets triggered and you got to bring it in. But there is no perfect system because you're trying to forecast something that's very difficult to forecast. But you can't ignore it either because that's a forecast as well. Adam, you have a question? You already answered it, thank you. Okay. Sammy, you have another question? One question, uh, looking at the, uh, so we talked about the political risk, we can still go deeper and look at uh, corruption in countries? And corruption is easier. I'll tell you why it's easier. Corruption is like, an, is like a tax, right? So if you operate in a corrupt country, your corporate tax rate might be 20%, but by the time you bribe and, and pay off all the corrupt individuals, it's more like 45%. So you know what you do? You value a company in a corrupt country, you don't use the stated tax rate, you use the implicit tax rate with corruption built in. You know what the most insidious of human behaviors you can bring into the valuation? So that's what I would do is I just use a higher tax rate. In fact, KPMG, about seven or eight years ago, did a, did a survey where they actually converted corruption into a tax rate by country. 
It's actually fascinating because in corrupt countries, your tax rate implicitly could be 60 or 65 percent. So it's one way to think about what corruption does. It basically adds to your cost structure and reduces your earnings and cash flows. Why do you bake it into the tax rate? Well, it's because the tax rate takes out, it reduces your income, right? So basically that's what corruption does is you thought your expenses were 30 30 percent of your revenues but by the time you pay everybody in the chain it's 55 percent of revenue so it's like a, just a way of reducing your earnings no, it's, not, it's not that your actual like, yeah, no because it's not going to the government that's the difference right it's in fact here's what happens only 20 percent goes to the government the other 40 percent goes to a bunch of people who effectively are collecting implicit taxes along the way if you ever lived in a corrupt country, that's exactly how it feels, right? It's like everybody has their hand in your pocket, not just the government. Yeah. How do you account for accounting practices that you might not be able to trust, like in a maybe in dictatorship or otherwise? Uh, that's, quite, that's independent of dictatorships or democracies, right? That's just a question of how the accounting rules are written, how they're enforced. I'll tell you one thing, though. That, that worry has become much smaller for me, at least, over the last 30 years. 30 years ago, you had like 50 different accounting systems around the world. You had very, very, very gray area accounting in many, many parts of the world. Today, now much of the world is either IFRS or IFRS based or GAAP based. So I think there's more convergence of accounting standards because everybody wants foreign institutional investment investors to invest in them. But if you look at smaller companies in some emerging markets, you've got to worry about fraud. It's not even accounting practice. It's doubt, outright fraud. And you know what? When we talked about fraud, the problem is you, know, you only know after the facts. So that's why forensic accounting is such a useful skill. So if you're investing in a lot of companies, small companies in emerging markets, I would invest in a good forensic accounting book because the financial statements are just the start of your research. You have to dig in and dig in and dig in to see if they're actually telling you the truth. Okay, so shall we move on? Go ahead. So, um, other than corruption and let's say political risk, is there anything that we we may miss where it's worth looking at? Anything you may miss, like acts of God, right? We, we make assumptions that the world, I mean, I, th I think that's what this, I mean, something like this brings home, right? This is something nobody's ever seen before. If you ask me, why didn't you bring it into evaluations last year? If I had that much foresight, you know, I'd be a, you know, I'd be a messiah, right? I wouldn't be a financial analyst. So, now, it, 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 basically what it brings home is humility, which is there's so much we don't know that when we make our estimates, you got to say, you know, you you got to keep the door open to revisiting them, and don't beat yourself too badly when you make a mistake because hey, there are things you can't forecast. It is what it is. Darshan, but, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, but yeah, Tokyo being like the home for earthquakes or something like the uh, area which is prone to uh, earthquakes or like, any like any other natural resources that continuously happen, does that uh, play? Does it affect your value? In fact, it does, right? But there is a way in which if you have a well-developed market system, those costs get smoothed out. How does it get smoothed out? In the US, for instance, I don't worry about earthquakes if I have a business in California. Why? Because you have an, insur because you have an insurance market. And also, there's an insurance market which converts that acts of God into a cost. Like I pay house insurance, home insurance, and uh, homeowners insurance in California, but I also pay earthquake insurance, which doubles my home insurance cost. So when you're a business in an in an in an act of God region, then your costs are going to be much higher, earnings are going to be much lower, and your cash flows reflect it. Your problem is, what if you have an act of God in a part of the world where there's no insurance? Then you have a more discrete risk. And that's when you have to bring out your discrete risk tools. And there it's actually probably easier. It's easier to estimate the probability of a natural disaster than it is to sometimes predict a political regime change, right? 
it's all physical sciences. So I think that's what that's that's what you keep in mind is if it's insurable, then it's e much more easily incorporated into valuation because your company will survive as a going concern. But if it's not insurable, then a bad bad act of God could basically mean the end of your company. Right. Siki. What? Did you have, you have your mic is open? Are you a question? Okay, so let's move on to the next thing that I want. Adam, you have a question? Is your hand up from before? That's, from, that's still from before. Okay. Uh, yeah. You don't know that. So, okay, I'll ignore your hand then. And so you've got to figure out another way to get my attention then if you need to get back. Now let's talk about valuing financial service companies, especially banks. So let me go through those four questions again that underlie how we value a business. And you can see already why valuing a bank is going to give you nightmares. What's the first question? What are your cash flows from existing assets? How do we measure cash flows? We start with earnings, we subtract out net capex, we subtract out change in working capital, we come up with cash flows, right? You're saying, what's the big deal? Try, try doing that for a bank. What's net capex for a bank? I have no idea. What's change in working capital? It could be everything or nothing. Estimating cash flows for a bank and insurance company investment bank is almost impossible to do. So that's the first problem. If you ask me what are my cash flows, I have no idea. When I ask you about capex and working capital and reinvestment, same problem. I have no idea. And I ask you how risky are you as a bank? Risk to a bank is very difficult to measure because debt to a bank is not a source of capital. It's raw material. So the old approach of lever up the bait is computer cost of capital doesn't quite work. And finally, when I ask you when will you be a mature company as a bank, your answer might not lie entirely in your control because you're a regulated institution most of the world and if the regulatory authorities dis decide you're too risky a bank, they could shut you down. You can already see why doing traditional discounted cash flow valuation for a bank is going to be really, really difficult. So for the longest time, we know what we used to do. When we valued banks, we always fell back on the dividend discount model. I tell people that I used to think that banks were easy to value. In fact, in some of my earlier editions of books, I actually put this down on paper, a statement I've never been able to live down. He said banks are easy to value. And I'll tell you what that statement was based on. It was based on two presumptions. The first was that banks were run by sensible people, the management of banks. And second, that the regulatory authority that governed banks would keep them from doing stupid things like taking too much risk. That was where I was coming from pre-2008. You think what happened in 2008? Come on, you know what happened in 2008. I discovered both my presumptions were wrong. First, I realized that the regulatory authorities would not keep banks on script, that they were banks could still wander off the reservation very easily. And second, I realized in hindsight that banks are run by some of the least sensible people on the face of the earth. So I'm going to apply the old way of valuing banks first, and then we'll talk about how I have had to change that approach given mostly what I've learned from looking. So the old way of valuing banks are valued based on dividends. And here I'm going to value an Egyptian bank. Why an Egyptian bank? I've never valued an Egyptian company before. I was just interested. So I'm going to value an Egyptian bank called CIB and I'm going to value it in Egyptian pounds. So let me start with the discount rate first. To get the discount rate, I needed a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds. And if you look at my risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds, I start with a dollar risk-free rate, the T-bond rate and adjusted for differential inflation. You're saying, why don't you just look up a Egyptian government bond rate? Egypt, Egypt doesn't have long-term government bonds. This is the only way I could get a risk-free rate in pounds was to take the dollar rate and adjust for differential inflation. If you don't remember that, go back and check your risk-free rate section of your notes, and it's an approach we came up with there. For the beta, I used the beta for banks. I didn't under have lever and re-lever. Why? Because I have no idea what the debt for a bank is. I am implicitly assuming that all banks are equally risky. For the equity risk premium, it looks huge, but that's because CIB is entirely Egypt-based. That was my equity risk premium for Egypt. You put those numbers together, I come up with a cost of equity in Egyptian pounds of 23.25%. 23.25%? You say, that's really high. Well, if your inflation rate is 8, 9, 10%, that's exactly what you should expect. To discount the cash flows, I started with, with dividends. Why? Because I took the old ploy of, hey, I can't estimate cash flows. The dividends in the most recent year was one pound per share on a 4.04 earnings, basically about a 25% dividend payout ratio. 
I assumed the payout ratio would stay at 25% at least for the next five years. So during those five years, I'm going to be pay, paying out 25%. I'm reinvesting 75%. That's my retention ratio. CIB has a sky high return on equity. But again, remember, these are all in Egyptian pounds. Retention ratio times return equity gives me a growth rate of 32%. Dazzling growth, but again, it's an Egyptian pound growth rate. It's a good bank, but not as good as it looks based on the pure numbers. At the end of year 10, I put them in stable growth and I give them a growth rate of 10% forever. Mind-bogglingly high, right? Well, 10% a year forever basically is okay when your inflation rate is close to 10%. In fact, the risk-free rate is 10.53%. To get my retention ratio in steady state, I assume the return equity, which is 42%, will drop towards 25%, which is barely above their cost of equity anyway. And I computed a payout ratio of 60%. So basically, given the growth rate and the return equity, they can pay out 60%. So let's summarize. For the next five years, CIB is going to have a 32% growth in dividends per year. And after that, the growth rate is going to come down to 10%. And as it comes down, the payout ratio is going to climb to 60%. I estimate the dividends every year. It's a pure dividend discount model. And the dividends climb over time, partly because my growth is decreasing and my payout ratio is increasing, and partly because my earnings themselves are growing. I discount those dividends back at the cost of equity. What I get as a present value per share is about 42 pounds per share. The stock was actually trading at around 30, I forget now, 36 pounds. I actually tried to buy CIB. I could not even get my hands on the shares. I mean, I, I have no connections in the Egyptian equity market. If any of you do, let me know. But this is a pure dividend discount model valuation. You're saying, where does the trust in managers come in? Well, when I discount dividends, what I'm assuming managers are doing, they're paying out what they can afford to in dividends. When I use the average beta for banks to come up with the cost of equity, what am I assuming? That you can't have really risky banks because the regulatory authorities are going to keep it from happening. That's where the trust comes in. And if you have trust, then the dividend discount model works. So let's take a look at what makes banks so messy. Banks are incredibly opaque entities. What I mean by that, is when you read the financial statements for a bank, you learn far less about the bank than you do when you read the financial statements for a traditional company. Why? Because there's so much banks don't tell us, right? They tell us they have loans, but they don't tell us what percent of the loans are in trouble and how much they will have trouble collecting on the loans. So for decades now, we've had a Faustian bargain, which is banks don't tell us much about themselves but we trust the regulatory authorities because the banks are supposed to give them the information that the regulatory authorities are, do, are doing their job. So that's why the dividend discount model has such roots when you value banks or insurance companies or investment banks. But I'll make a confession. I don't trust banks anymore. And I'll tell you the last time I trusted banks was just before 2008. So I, I call September 12th of 2008 my last day of innocence where I said banks are safe, I can value them with the dividend discount model. In fact, three weeks into that crisis, I valued Wells Fargo using a traditional dividend discount model. And here's what I did. I took their trailing 12 month data, which looked the same as it did before the crisis. So the numbers looked pretty good. They had $1.18 in dividends on $2.16 in earnings per share. Their return on equity coming into the crisis was 17.56%. But this was three weeks into the crisis. And I said, what is the crisis going to do to my valuation? So here's what I did. Given that I have very, very you know, basic information, I don't know how the crisis will affect their earnings. I said, going forward, I think the regulatory authorities are going to demand much higher regulatory capital ratios. You say, well, why is that even a part of the process? When banks have to maintain more regulatory capital, let's say 30% more capital, their old return on equity no longer applies. Their new return equity is going to be much lower, even if they make the same net income they did before. So I lower the return equity to 13.5%. That is the one thing that I changed post-crisis. Here's the second thing I changed. My equity risk premium in September of 2008, before the crisis was 4%, I raised to 5%. Higher cost of equity, lower return equity. The lower return equity pushes down my growth. The higher cost of equity make, pushes up my discount rate. So when I push down the growth, my expected dividends in the future get lower. So this is a post-crisis valuation. I push up the risk premium, my cost of equity gets higher. 
I discount the dividends and the terminal value back at that cost of equity. What I get as a present value is $30.29. The stock was trading at 32. It had dropped about 40% during the previous four weeks. When I looked at the value, I said, look, the stock has dropped, but it's not a bargain. Something I would caution you do as well. Now with this crisis, there are lots of stocks that have dropped 30, 40, 50% in price. Just because it dropped in price doesn't make them undervalued. And the valuation you did before the crisis, if you jumped on this and you've done the valuation already in the end of February, March, you got to revisit it. At the very minimum, give them the higher risk premiums because that's going to affect your value. And that's what should drive your decision now, not what you did now. Now, Nathaniel asked, do you include buybacks? There is a version of this model when you can, with banks where you can use buybacks. So basically, instead of just using dividends, you can use dividends plus buybacks. Just be careful because buybacks tend to be lumpy. You know what I mean by that? Banks don't buy a, a, a smoothed out amount every year. They actually buy three billion in one year, don't buy for the next two years. So if you're going to bring in buybacks, look at the buybacks across time. So you can have dividends plus buybacks over the last five or 10 years. But um, you can expand this model, but you're still trusting managers to pay out what they can afford to. Any questions on the dividend discount model? No? How much is the ERP increase post Corona? Well, one answer I gave you was in the updated spreadsheet I sent last Friday. Actually, tomorrow, watch for the post I'm going to make because I've computed the equity risk premium by day through this entire crisis. So I'm going to report the premium as of today and how it's changed every day for the last six weeks. It's kind of an interesting graph. And I also am including in that post what I found in 2008 during that crisis. And you can set them next to each other and see how the numbers are behaving. Any other questions about uh, dividend discount models and banks? Let me ask you a question. Can you value a bank with a dividend discount model if it's not paying dividends today? Sanjana, you said yes, and you're absolutely right. Tell me how you do it. Um, you can use um, forecasted dividends. Exactly. And, and why would the forecasted dividends be positive? What's going to cause them to become positive? You assume that some of the earnings the net income is distributed to in other words, up front, it's a high growth bank. It's paying no dividends. You're saying that's okay. But as the growth decreases, you know what's going to happen, right? The potential payout ratio will increase. So your dividends in the future can still be positive. So I've heard people say you cannot use a dividend discount model for a non-dividend paying company. That's not true. You can still use a dividend discount model. I don't think it's the greatest of all models to use, but you can still use a dividend discount model if you think about dividends in the future being computed by you given the growth rate and the, and the return equity. Professor, I have a question. Yep. Why would the dividends go up as the growth is going down? Because you, why, why, why are you retaining money? Why do banks retain money? To, fund, to allow yourself to grow over time, right? So if your growth is very high, you have to retain almost all of your earnings because if you don't retain your earnings, how can you grow? So this is actually a gentle proposition in all evaluation. As growth decreases, your free cash flows or the cash flows you're computing will always increase simply because when you grow slower, you have to reinvest less. If you have to reinvest less, you can pay out more. Okay. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you do the model, check the risk premium. At the minimum. That's the, so don't stop there. If you're doing an airline, that's why in my spreadsheet, what else do I let you do? You increase the risk premiums, but you also have to adjust for the fact that your earnings next year are not going to be some smoothed out growth rate over last year. You know, 2020 is going to be a disaster for you. So you got to put that hit in, and then you also have to put in how much and how quickly you will recover from that head. So you kind of yeah. do it even though the information is not there yet. How do you think about, let's say, if the cash flows earnings are saying, which is not the case obviously for almost all companies, but let's say if earnings, uh, sorry, equity risk premium is only thing that has gone up. Then you should buy those stocks if they've gone down a lot. Mm. Or you could, have, I mean, let's take a zoom. What's happened to its earnings and cash flows because of the crisis? It's gone up, right? So your valuation of Zoom now will be higher than it was six weeks ago. Mm 
United Airlines, it's going to collapse. If you take Kroger's or a grocery store, it might be relatively unchanged. So you can see you can have cash flows go up, cash flows go down. That's why you need to ask that question because it can be different for different companies. Thank you. Well, as you know, the Zoom security, I mean, it's true. Zoom, is, uh, is, Zoom was never designed for what it's being used for. So of course it's insecure, right? So if you have a national security meeting on Zoom, you're going to have people Zoom bomb the meeting and take all this, the information from you. So, and you can't blame Zoom for it. Zoom was never designed for this many people using it in this many contexts. So I think you can complain about it, but the reality is I'm on Zoom and so are a million other people. You know? So it is what it is. So we'll see how it works out. So let me talk a little bit about this trust issue. As I said, pre-2008, I trusted that banks were run by sensible people and I trusted that the regulatory apparatus actually worked. I don't have that trust anymore. I no longer think that bank regulators can keep track of banks and I no longer think banks are run by sensible people. So you think, what are you going to do now? Well, I have to try to compute cash flows. I can't trust dividends anymore, right? So here's how I'm going to think about cash flows. Now, when you value a non-financial service company, a manufacturing company, a retail company, a tech company. Book equity is almost a non-issue, right? The only place it might show up is in your return equity calculations. But lots of companies have negative book equities and you just move on saying, who really cares? For a bank, book value of equity actually matters because it becomes the basis for computing regulatory capital. Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, all the different measures of regulatory capital are built on book value of equity. So what that also means is if you have a bank which has a book value of equity problem, it has a regulatory capital problem. That was the opening I used. I said, it's true, I can't tell you what the capex for a bank is or depreciation of working capital, but this much I know. For a bank to grow and be healthy, its regulatory capital ratios have to be sustainable. So here's how I redefined free cash flow equity. I took the net income, and the only thing you can value for a bank or a financial service company is equity. Don't even try to do cost of capital and firm valuation because debt is not a source of capital. So it's equity focused, and I want to get free cash flow equity. I took net income, but instead of subtracting out net capex and change in working capital, which is what you do for traditional free cash flow equity, I defined reinvestment for a bank as what they have to reinvest in their regulatory capital. So think about it. If you have a high growth bank, your regulatory capital has to grow faster. So high growth banks will have lower free cash flows equity or even negative free cash flows equity than stable banks. If you're a bank in trouble, which you've had losses or you've had a regulatory fine imposed on you, your regulatory capital ratios have dropped, you will have to reinvest more than a bank that is well capitalized, that has a regulatory capital ratio that's high. I now have a mechanism where I can bring in those factors into my free cash flow equity. So with no further ado, I'm going to take you through a valuation I did about four years ago of Deutsche Bank. In fact, this was a blog post. If you're interested, I'll send you the link to this post. Was, you know, the title of the post was a Greek tragedy at a German bank. And I thought it was, you know, what's a, what's the German word? Schadenfreude? No, it's a, it was a, because the Germans keep like to, to keep remind and like to remind us of how undisciplined the Greeks are. And here you have the ultimate German institution, Deutsche Bank, behaving like a Greek bank. And let me explain. Deutsche Bank is one of, one of Germany's most well-established, best-known, largest banks. And for a century, it's been around for 150 years. It's been, it was in emerging markets before most other banks even knew there were emerging markets. And it was a very successful history. And it was very ambitious pre-2008, trying to grow all over the world, especially their investment banking business. And of course, 2008 was an iceberg for them. They hit the iceberg and like the Titanic, they didn't quite recover. So every year since 2008, they've, they've kept losing money. A billion. So unlike other banks that came back by 2012 or 13, Deutsche kept continuing to lose money. And every time you lose money as a bank, remember it's money coming out of your book equity and your regulatory capital. So every year that they were losing money, the regulatory capital ratio kept dropping and they kept losing money. So this was in 2016, they get the final blow. Now, Department of Justice puts an $8 billion fine on Deutsche for something they did in 2008. So you take $8 billion out of book equity, all of a sudden Deutsche's tier one capital ratio is down to 12.41%. You're saying, so what, is that high, is that low? The 75th percentile for all banks is 15.67% and given Deutsche's investment banking business, they actually were closer to the, they should be closer to 
Already you can see that Deutsche is in the hole. It has too little regulatory capital, 12.41 versus 15.67. On top of that, they lost $8.9 billion in the 12 months leading into this valuation. $8.9 billion net income or net loss. I assumed over time, and this is my optimistic story for Deutsche, is that their return on equity would go from negative to positive and climb over time to get to 9.44%. You're saying that's very precise. What's the 9.44%? That actually is their cost of equity in steady state. So in my optimistic story, here's what I think will happen. Deutsche will survive, its losses will become profits, but even in my best case scenario, the best case I'm hoping for for Deutsche is that return equity will converge on the cost of equity. I'm ready to value the bank with that, that story in place. So here's what I do. As my return equity goes from negative to positive, my losses become profits. So there's my net income. It's book value of equity times return equity. For my investment in regulatory capital, I assume that over time, Deutsche would raise their tier one capital ratio to 15.67%, with bigger increases coming up front because they're in the most danger up front. So if you look at year one, I have to reinvest $6.6 .6 billion in regulatory capital. So take year one, they have a $5.1 billion loss, a $6.6 .6 billion investment in regulatory capital, their total free cash flow equity in year one is minus $11.7 billion. That's pretty bad news, right? In fact, for the next three year, next four years, they have negative cash flows, and only in year five will they be able to return any cash to equity investors. So this is my optimi optimistic story where Deutsche fixes itself, both in terms of losses and regulatory capital. The value per share that I got was $23, basically discounting the cash flows back at the cost of equity. Early on, I gave them a high cost of equity. Why? Because they have a low tier one capital ratio. To me, the driver of risk at banks is not the traditional drivers. It's basically how well capitalized are you? So as they get more capitalized, their cost of equity converges on the median. I discount back, I get a value per share of $23 per share. I do think there's a chance that Deutsche will not make it, which doesn't mean that Deutsche is going to go bankrupt and be shut down because banks don't actually go get shut down. What they effectively will get, will, what will happen to Deutsche is what happened to the Royal Bank of Scotland. Deutsche will, be, will have to be taken over by the German government if it gets into serious trouble and essentially run as a government-owned bank till they can flip it out again. But if that happens, my equity is worth nothing. I test a 10% chance that Deutsche would not make it as a going concern bank and my equity would therefore have to go to zero. 90% times 23 plus 10% times zero is $21 per share. The stock was trading at 13. I actually bought it at 13. This could have been a horror story if I'd held on, but I got lucky because a year later, they did a regulatory capital issue, raising about 11 billion. That's 11 billion that they had raised. They, they were right on cue. And I was lucky enough to actually cash out at the regulatory offering because if I'd held on, you know what Deutsche is trading it right now? Middle single digits, $6, $7 per share. This is a company that seems to be not just hitting one iceberg, but manages to hit an iceberg every year. It's like a disaster movie in motion. So if you if you look at if you look at a bank and you want you don't want to trust dividends, look at the free cash flows to equity. Any questions? Um, yeah, I have one. So Go ahead. banks also deal with a lot of uh, risk which is off balance sheet, like writing options and stuff. So how do you take care of those risks? Well, those are usually, con I mean, if you're, this is where the regulatory authority trust comes in, right? If you really don't trust regulatory authorities, it's almost impossible to value a bank. In, in the U.S., I, you know, there, there are off-balance sheet items. I assume that there are off-balance sheet items that are offset by off-balance sheet assets. I mean, you shouldn't have naked positions on your off-balance sheet. Liability. So I don't think that's the issue. I'll be quite honest. I don't, when you fail at a bank, it's usually because not if they have off balance sheet issues, it's because of on balance sheet issues. I'll tell you the classic problem with an Indian bank is you have lots of loans outstanding. Half of them might be non performing. And if you're doing your accounting and the regulatory work right, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to take those non performing loans off the books. You're supposed to take losses and you're supposed to come up with fresh capital. But that requires a regulatory authority that's actually awake and trying to enforce that. 
So that's why it's so difficult to value a bank without trust in the regulatory authority at least doing a basic job of keeping those banks on the reservation. I work very closely with Indian banks, you know that. <laughs> well, I think that, they, and you know, you know, and you've seen horror stories with Indian banks precisely for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. The, so when they're making investments in regulatory capital, they're, they're investing basically it's retained earnings. Shit. See, you don't actually invest in regulatory capital. What you do is retain earnings or raise right. fresh equity and it goes into your regulatory capital. It you know, happens almost automatically as your book equity goes up. And what, what is that tier one capital being used for? It's right. just like held as, asset? it has to be held as liquid assets. Basically what tier one capital is supposed to be there for is when the bank hits a shock that you have enough capital and remember that banks have been around for 700 years, well before regulatory authorities came about. You know how the Rothschilds ran banks in the 1400s and the 1500s is they made loans, but they kept aside enough equity that if there was a bad year and they had shocks to the system, they could cover those shocks. That's what regulatory capital is supposed to do. Is it supposed to protect the bank in the in, when loans don't get paid. So that's what it's held for. It's held as capital just in case. And so the, the big risk that you're preventing against is the risk of so many loans defaulting. Exactly. To all of your tier one capital. Exactly. And Which is going to happen either because you've been really sloppy on your loans and the regulatory guy was sleeping or because it's an economic crisis. And you know what? This year you're going to have a lot of banks with a lot of bad loans on their portfolios. Not because they didn't do their homework, but because they've lent to oil companies and the oil price is now down to $22 a barrel. The question is, are these banks adequately capitalized to cover those losses? Well, we're going to find out, right? And the reason that question is so hard to answer, like if you were asking the question, which banks will succeed and which banks will fail based on how well capitalized they, they won't are, it's because of yeah. the complexity and exactly. the capacity of their loan portfolios. And, and, and let me add something else. It's not like the old days where banks just said loan portfolios. When you do JP Morgan, you see the problem? It's not just that they're a bank, they're an investment. This is the problem we created when we let banks wander off and start to do investment banking and real estate and brokerage and portfolio management, you know, is it's much more difficult to deal with the risks happening on the side because while you're worrying about the bank, some other part of the bank might be blowing up. a very niche question uh, so there's lots of perpetual debt also a part of regulatory capital yeah I've, ne I've never understood why now why the regulatory authorities allow that loophole right and we'll talk about debt and equity the notion that something is equity because it doesn't have a finite life strikes me as absurd no but as i said this is the problem with having these these loopholes in regulatory capital that allow banks to issue debt and call it equity at least for regulatory purposes I don't like it. Yeah. One final point and then we will end for the day. I mean, if you get a chance, review the section on valuing companies with intangible assets. Go, you know, check out how we capitalize R&D. And I'll very quickly hit you at what, why, what, what this is all about. Because when you capitalize R&D, you probably wondered why we were spending so much time on capitalizing R&D. After all, it doesn't change your free cash for the firm. And when we come back on Wednesday, I'm going to start by looking at how capitalizing R&D traces through into your earnings, your cash flows, your growth rate, your return in capital. And we're going to see that capitalizing R&D will have an effect on value, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And what I'd like you to think about is what type of R, you know, what has to be true for a company where capitalizing R&D increases value and what has to be true for companies where capitalizing R&D decreases value because both can happen. So we'll talk about that on Wednesday when we start. But uh, thank you for hanging, uh, for uh, joining me. I mean, especially after you've spent an hour on the quiz. But I will talk to you Wednesday. Any last questions before I sign off? Sammy, go ahead. Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay, go ahead, Julieta. Yeah, so you were mentioning the different risks within the bank. How do you calculate the beta then taking into account like investment banking and like corporate banking? Now, in the next couple of sessions, we're going to talk about some of the parts valuation. Maybe we need to value banks in pieces, but I'll be, you know, when we talked about complexity, what do we say? When something becomes so complex, 
that you can't value it. What do we start doing? We start discounting the value. That's exactly what's happening to money center banks now. Is I throw up my hands when I value JP Morgan because at some point it's not that I can't, don't have the tools, I don't have the information because it's too diffuse. I think money center banks are being punished for creating these complex monstrosities. And that's exactly the attitude you're going to run into with some of these banks is you're going to get to a point and say, I give up. And when you give up is when you either go to pricing or you just don't buy that bank as an investor. You let, you let the traders but trade banks and you let investors walk away and buy something else. Please. Yeah. Rob asked Deutsche Bank at $6 strong buy. Watch out for the next iceberg. As I said, this, this is like, you know, what, you know, watching one of those Halloween movies where you get this, you know, Freddy Krueger come back over and over. Deutsche and Freddy Krueger are good friends, so they'll meet again. No, I, I, I would not, I'll be quite honest, you know, Deutsche just, I, I have no idea what's going on in that place. But it's amazing how many problems they create for themselves as they keep moving through time. No. Sammy, last question? No, actually, if, okay. if you allow me, I'm just thanking everyone who shared this screen. It's, it's good to feel that you're not an easy page. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop my sh stop for today and I will see you on Wednesday. Take care.